When she was commissioned in 1914, USS Texas was amongst the most powerful warships in the world. Along with her sister ship, USS New York, they were the first American ships to mount the powerful 14-inch guns, super dreadnoughts built to keep up with the naval arms race that had been going on between the Germans and the British Navy in the run-up to the First World War. But despite the sheer power and massive build-up of the great fleets and steel behemoths through the era of the Great War, the decisive naval engagement that they all envisioned never materialized. Still, the Allied Navy and the Grand Fleet, of which USS Texas was a part, played a vital role in the war to end all wars. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Though it is usually called the New York class, Texas was actually launched and commissioned first, beating her sister ship by several months. Both ships were commissioned in 1914 and saw their first significant mission in a show of force against Mexico in the Tampico Affair, where American forces occupied Vera Cruz for seven months. The New York class ships were meant to replace the earlier Wyoming class ships, the last American ships to use 12-inch guns, and were the first in the world to mount 14-inch guns. The Texas was christened by Claudia Lyon, daughter of Colonel Cecil Lyon, a wealthy rancher and Republican National Committeeman. In the years prior to World War I, the Texas stayed in the Atlantic, training and performing tactical and gunnery drills. Tensions were still high. Woodrow Wilson had pursued a strictly neutral position, but the conflict threatened to bubble over. In the years leading up to World War I, Germany had attempted to strengthen their fleet significantly with the goal of becoming a threat to the Royal Navy. Unfortunately for Germany, England had a significant head start and a policy of making sure their navy was the most powerful in the world. Until 1912, the British policy was the two-power standard, a strategy that involved having a navy as powerful as the next two naval powers combined. In 1912, that policy changed to a strategy of having a navy 60% more powerful than the second strongest navy. By August of 1914, England had 22 dreadnoughts with a further 13 under construction compared to Germany's 15 with 5 under construction, one of which would never be completed. Truthfully, neither country's leadership wanted a direct conflict. England was primarily concerned with the protection of the huge but vitally important trade routes that connected her to her far-flung empire, while Germany was well aware that her navy was outmatched. Germany hoped to use submarine warfare and mines to eventually whittle down the Royal Navy enough that an engagement could be fought on more equal terms. The German Navy had some success in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, but the situation was different in the Atlantic. The first significant battle was fought on August 28, 1914, only weeks after Britain had declared war on Germany. The Battle of Heligoland Bight was a defeat for the Germans. One British ship was sunk for four to the Germans, and the British killed or captured a thousand men, with only 35 of their own killed. Like the Western Front on land, the war after that became one of attrition. German surface ships remained largely at anchor, while submarines attempted to shrink the British fleet. In August of 1914, the British had put together a new fleet they dubbed the Grand Fleet, which included 25 to 35 capital ships at any given time, and was based alternatively out of Scapa Flow in the Orkney Islands and the Firth of Forth. The German strategy was not entirely hopeless. A German submarine in September sank three older British cruisers, and the battleship HMS Audacious was sunk by a mine a month later. The main objective of the British Navy was to enforce their blockade, it was relatively easy for the British to secure the English Channel, but more difficult for them to guard the approach between northern Scotland and Scandinavia. The blockade ran afoul of American attempts to remain steadfastly neutral. More damaging to U.S. interest, however, was Germany's submarine warfare, which was unable to bring U.K. trade to a halt and often targeted ships flying under neutral flags. This included the sinking of the Lusitania, which was carrying significant amounts of ammunition, but also nearly 2,000 civilians. Of the more than 1,100 people that died, 128 were U.S. citizens. In 1916, the largest naval battle of the war was fought at Jutland between the Grand Fleet and the German High Seas Fleet. Jutland was a significant conflict, among the largest naval surface engagements in history and the last to be fought primarily by battleships. The battle began as an attempt by the Germans to lure a portion of the Grand Fleet out and destroy it, but became a fight between over 250 surface ships over the course of two days. Ultimately, 14 British ships and 11 German ships were sunk, and the British lost over 6,000 men to Germany's 2,500. But despite the loss of ships, the English fleet had successfully contained the German fleet, which would remain mostly at port for the rest of the war. The battle drove Germany to focus on unrestricted submarine warfare, beginning in early 1917, which, with the interception of the Zimmermann telegram, directly led to the U.S. declaration of war on April 6. The declaration of war found Texas at anchor with the other Atlantic Fleet battleships in the York River, and for the first few months of the war she trained merchant ship crews on guns for possible encounters with German submarines. 
It was a crew that trained on the Texas that fired America's first shots in the war from the USS Mongolia at a U-boat on April 19th. Texas was repaired in preparation for sailing to Europe in August, but before she could join the Grand Fleet, she ran into a problem. Literally. On September 27th, the ship ran aground on Block Island off the coast of Rhode Island. The accident was blamed mostly on the ship's navigator, who made a turn too early, apparently confused by shore lights and more concerned with avoiding American mines in place in Long Island Sound. The Texas ran aground hard on Crescent Beach. The 573-foot-long ship was aground past amidships, so over 200 feet. For the next few days, the crew removed as much weight as possible, including thousands of tons of coal, munitions, anchor chain, and anything not nailed down, taken to free the ship, but to no avail. Her sister ship arrived to offer moral support, shouting, Come on, Texas! to encourage the crew to get free. This call to arms would eventually become the battle cry of the Texas across her many years of service. Finally, on October 1st, she was pulled free with the assistance of several tugboats and returned to dry dock for repairs. The ship was repaired, but spent the rest of 1917 conducting training and earning awards for battle efficiency and gunnery, before finally rejoining New York in Battleship Division 9, then known as the 6th Battle Squadron of the Grand Fleet. The 6th Squadron had been broken up in 1915 before Battleship Division 9 took up the moniker in 1917. The division included five battleships, including the Texas, New York, Wyoming, Florida, and Delaware. And Delaware was later replaced by the Arkansas. After two weeks at sea, much of it alone, when the Texas arrived, she immediately resupplied with coal and set out to sea with the fleet the very next day. The Texas and her fellowships didn't sit still during this time, participating in convoy missions, which had proved effective against German submarine attacks and reinforcing the blockade that the British had held for the whole war. A cruise book written after the war says the crew was spoiling for a fight, sailing out into the cold gray reaches of the North Sea with some of her consorts ostensibly on a convoy trip to Norway, but really in the hope of inducing the German fleet to come out. Certainly the service was not without its danger either, and the book reports that U-boats time and again bobbed up unexpectedly close to us. They also dealt with bad weather, gray skies, and small hurricane-like wind. They did sortie out a number of times with the fleet, notably in April, chasing after the rumor or the reality of German ships in the sea, but they never came face to face with their foe. The crewmen spent countless hours coaling the ship, bringing on coal for the engines, and then cleaning the ship afterwards. One crewman was killed in an accident when a toolbox was dropped on his head, and the crew was able to put out a fire that started under one of their magazines. Crewmen put on shows, played basketball, greeted the English king, and flirted with the local girls. They also protected mine laying ships, which helped put together the 240 mile long North Sea Mine Barrier, which stretched from the Orkney Islands to Norway. Other than firing a few shots at possible submarines, by November of 1918, the Texas and the Grand Fleet had not seen significant combat. On the day of the armistice, the fleet celebrated while the admirals of the Allied Grand Fleet conferred with the German fleet. On November 20th, Admiral Sir David Beatty, High Commander of the Grand Fleet, sent a message. A sufficient force will proceed to sea to take over at Rendezvous X, those ships of the German high seas fleet selected for internment. As the fleet headed out to meet the German fleet, Admiral Beatty kept everyone on high alert, prepared for the possibility that this meeting would not be peaceful. When they met the fleet, the German flagship flew a white flag. The Texas cruise book noted, There is no white bunting on board the Texas. The Grand Fleet sailed in a double column, with the German boats between them. Dozens of ships and thousands of men surrendered without firing a shot. A newspaperman asked the captain, Victor Blue, if he would have preferred a fight, to which he answered no, as this was the most signal victory in naval history and I'd much prefer to bring my boys home victorious to their mothers than to leave any of them at the bottom of the North Sea. The importance of the Grand Fleet was much more significant than their combat record might suggest. Though the Grand Fleet only fought a few significant battles with the Germans, they kept the bulk of the German fleet, an enormous amount of manpower and war material, at port, helpless to do more than keep part of the Allied fleet engaged. That was not an insignificant contribution or accomplishment for the Germans either, but it prevented the Germans from using their fleet to terrorize the Allied supply fleets, which the Germans could not cripple with their U-boats alone, while the Germans suffered significantly from the Allied blockade. The German strategy became one of a fleet in being, a tactic first described by Lord Torrington, a British commander, in 1690. By keeping a fleet safe in harbor, it may not be able to accomplish any offensive objectives. However, that fleet cannot be ignored, as it poses a dire risk if it can break out. Like the stalemate in France, the two fleets took a number of actions aimed at altering the balance of the war, but each action was ultimately inconclusive. Unlike the stalemate in France, the appearance of the American forces did not alter the balance decisively. 
There was another aspect to the situation as well. On October 29th, not even two weeks before the armistice, the German Admiralty put together a plan to force the Grand Fleet into a decisive battle. The German sailors had been essentially idle for much of two years, and with only three major sorties in that time. Morale in the ships was low, and they saw their countrymen fight on the mainland, and discontent led to the arrest of 200 sailors and the execution of two in 1917. Unfortunately for the Germans, the British broke enough codes to be fully aware of the plan, but the German sailors were not convinced the attack was wise, and were afraid their leaders were intent on sacrificing them to torpedo ongoing armistice negotiations. Mutinous activity and even outright mutiny on the larger ships was widespread, and the Admiralty cancelled the action in the hopes of quelling the insurrection. This wasn't the end of the mutiny. Parts of the fleet returned to Kiel, Germany. On the way, several hundred of the mutineers were arrested. The sailors' tempers hadn't cooled, and they gathered in Kiel along with Union members and anti-war parties, which sought the freedom of the imprisoned sailors and the end of the war, peace, and bread. The so-called Kiel Mutiny sparked the wider November Revolution, which in a handful of days overthrew the Kaiser and led to the formation of the Weimar Republic. On December 1st, 1918, as the U.S. ships were preparing to return to the United States, Admiral Beatty gave a speech. In it he said, I've received messages from several people offering sympathy to the Grand Fleet. My answer is that we do not want sympathy. We want recognition of the fact that the reputation of the Grand Fleet stood so high that it was sufficient to cause the enemy to surrender without striking a blow. That is a significant accomplishment. And the American Navy and USS Texas, one of the most powerful battleships in the world, played their part. Had they failed or been destroyed, it's difficult to say how different history might be. Without even fighting that decisive battle, they did their duty. And USS Texas would continue to serve, playing a significant role in the Second World War, where she earned five battle stars. Today, the USS Texas is the last remaining of the World War I-era dreadnoughts. She was the first American battleship to be made a permanent museum, and the first to be designated a U.S. National Historic Landmark. But her long years at the dock at the San Jacinto Battlegrounds historic site have taken a toll on her. The Battleship Texas Foundation has embarked on a campaign to restore the ship, and if you are interested in helping to preserve this piece of American history, the Foundation encourages you to shout, Come on, Texas! and donate at BattleshipTexas.org. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. 